Um, as Bray mentioned, I'm Jessica Besson. I'm the horticulture agent in Mercer County. And tonight I will be sharing information with you all about uh, monarch butterflies and what you can do uh, to, help, to help them out. So we'll get started. All right. So first off, just a little bit of background about butterflies in general. So butterflies are a part of the order we call Lepidoptera, which means scale wings. So all butterflies have scale wings. Butterflies and moths, that's on their wings. If you ever picked one up and you felt it and you have a little dusty on it, those are actually scales coming off those wings. All butterflies and moths go through complete metamorphosis. So uh, the monarch is always that classic example that we show children of of where you have the egg, it hatches out, it turns into the caterpillar, it eats a lot, then it goes into its cocoon, its chrysalis, where it pupates, and then it emerges as a butterfly. So complete metamorphosis is where it goes in. It starts off looking like something completely different than when it does as an adult. They also have different eating habits as well from when they're a larvae to when they're an adult. All butterflies have siphoning mouth parts. So they have this long proboscis. It's this, and it coils up underneath their mouth and they uncoil it and stick it down in for a plant and um, suck up their ne nectar uh, like a straw through there. So a few things that are important with butterflies is touch. Uh, they have tactile setae on their feet and on their body. And these are just hairs and the caterpillars have these as well as the adults. And this helps them um, avoid predators. They can feel vibrations uh, or when something gets close to them trying to attack or eat them. Hearing wise, butterflies, they I don't think they have very good hearing uh, from what studies that have been done on them. Uh, they usually go off vibrations that, that help them to avoid predators. Uh, they, there has been some studies that show like if you clap loudly around butterflies, they will actually, you know, they will disperse uh, at first, but usually if you keep doing it over and over again and they realize there's no sense of danger, they will quickly stay in one place. Uh, when it comes to vision, the larvae or caterpillars have very poor eyesight. They have very small eyes called ocelli um, and they can't see very well with them. They can tell the difference between dark and light, light, um, just dark and light coming through the darkness and, and the brightness of the sun. Uh, adults though have compound eyes and have very good vision and they can see a wide spectrum of colors from anything from red to ultraviolet light uh, when they're out searching for uh, nectar sources. Another thing that's very important with butterflies is taste and smell. So they have chemoreceptors on their antenna and their tarsi, which are, if you're an entomologist, uh, you know that you're basically talking about the feet on insects. Uh, on males, in particular with butterflies, they tend to have some sensory glands on their wings. And these are useful with courtship and pheromones. Uh, and, but oddly enough, monarchs don't really tend to use those. And we'll talk a little bit about those as well um, as we get off, moving along. But females, on the other hand, have some very important uh, sensories on their legs. And these legs are important for the female butterfly because they will use them to tap on certain plants, to taste and smell them, uh, to make sure it's the right host plant to lay their legs. And I might be getting ahead of myself. This might be a little further on down in my talk too, but the monarch in particular, a uh, female butterfly goes around and she uses all six of those legs and taps on leaves to double check and make sure that uh, she's laying her eggs on milkweed. All right. So let's think about more particular monarch butterflies. That's what everyone is here tonight to learn about. Uh, so monarchs go from eggs to adult in about 30 days. So they will lay a single egg at a time and a female uh, monarch can lay anywhere between 100 to 300 eggs in her lifetime. So the caterpillars hatch out in four days. After that, caterpillars, they stay in their caterpillar form for 10 to, four day, 10 to 14 days, excuse me, and they go through five instars. And when we say instars, uh, this is where they're gonna start off. You look at this pyramid picture of uh, monarch caterpillars that I have there. Up at the top, you see the very tiny one, and that's gonna be the first instar. And when we say that it's a, after they go through an instar, it's when they are growing and they shed that exoskeleton. So they're shedding their skin as they, as they grow. And as each time they do that, we consider that an instar. And that's how we can tell how old a caterpillar is. And all butterflies go through this as well. 
Um, then they go into their pupa. So they go to pupate and they'll be in the chrysalis or we call the cocoon. Um, and that's where they will stay 10 to 14 days. And that's where that metamorphosis process takes place where they will go from looking from like their caterpillar to when they emerge, they will look like an adult uh, butterfly. So what's something that's really cool is that you can actually tell, and I'm sure there's other butterflies um, or moths as well that you can look on the chrysalis or the pupa, um, the chrysalis or the cocoon to tell if they're male or female. And this picture here is a really close picture, a close picture of one of those chrysalis there. And you can see when they have a little line, um, just the second segment down, I believe, and that's going to let you know that you have a female um, monarch in that chrysalis. And then after that, they emerge out and you have your adult butterfly. So the adult of the monarch's primary job is just to reproduce. Uh, a lot of our insects are that way. A lot of insects spend way more time, most of their life, as a larvae. Um, than they do, or as an immature, I should say, than they do as an adult. So the primary job is to reproduce. And then we have male versus female. So you can actually tell the difference between a male and female monarch if you're out there viewing them right now. The males have two little dots on their lower wings. So I should also mention that butterflies all have four wings. Um, and you wanna look and see the bottom wings with the little dots on them are gonna be your male monarch. These spots are specialized scales to produce the chemicals in courtship as I and these, but uh, the monarchs will do, can produce the, the, those chemicals, but at the same time, they don't really use them in their mating courtship. Uh, females, they don't have a spot on there. They tend to have a darker abdomen and wider veins on their wings. And that's how we can tell the difference between the two of them. Now, Kentucky State Insect is the Viceroy and it is often confused with the monarch. Many people, that's, this is a question I ask fifth graders every year, what's our state insect? And almost every time they say the monarch, but it's actually the viceroy. And you can tell easily the difference between the two. If you look at this bottom picture, you can see there's nice bands that go along the bottom wings of the viceroy versus the monarch that does not have them. And there's a reason why the viceroy wants to look like the monarch. As we know, as many people know, or maybe not everyone knows, uh, monarchs are selective eaters as caterpillars. They need milkweed in order to develop. Uh, milkweed is a latexy plant um, that is, is toxic to most other insects and other um, animals don't want to eat it. So that is why the viceroy wants to mimic the monarch. Uh, because it's it's not going to taste good. So the caterpillars are selective eaters. The adults are non-selective eaters. That means they, they don't care what they'll feed on. They will go and feed on any type of good nectar source. Uh, but but you, eating that milkweed gives them a chemical defense. So their coloration of that bright yellow, white and black is kind of a warning of like, hey, I might not taste that great. And especially when they're an adult, that bright orange is a warning. And there's a very uh, famous study that shows um, why that viceroy would want to look like the monarch. And from that lovely picture there that I have of a, a blue jay puking up a, a monarch. Basically, the scientists took monarchs and fed them to blue jays and they willingly snapped them up and ate them and then instantly got sick because of the, the milkweed uh, that those uh, caterpillars have ingested. Uh, so then when the scientists again offer them the blue jay a monarch, they quickly turn away because they recognize the color on it as something that they don't want to eat. So the viceroy gets to get away um, from being eaten by many pests, from many predators, uh, because of that coloration and it mimicking the monarch. Even though uh, birds could perfectly, you know, eat it and be totally fine, it gets to sneak by with mimicry. So the lifespan of monarchs, uh, there's about three to four generations a year. So when I say a generation, us entomology people are talking about uh, from the time it hatches out, it goes through its um, being a larvae uh, and its immature stage to an its adult and then it deceases. So they can have three or four generations a year in our, in, the, in our summer. So summer monarchs only live about three to five weeks. Uh, these are the ones that, you know, they're going to reproduce quickly. 
and they're not the ones that are preparing for the giant, the big migration. Uh, fall monarchs are going to live for eight to nine months because these are going to be the migration monarchs. These are the ones that, you know, when you think about monarchs, this is what you think about. One of the coolest phenomenons that of these little butterflies flying thousands of miles. An optimum viewing time for monarchs in our area is September, around September 19th through October 1st. Um, so I know I have seen quite a few adult monarchs out there right now, and uh, there's been some tagging and tracking of them lately, and we'll talk about that too coming up. Uh, but this is the prime time right now to go out and see monarchs starting to go on their way on their migration journey. So when it comes to migration, the fall monarchs are biologically different than the summer ones, and it's pretty, pretty cool if you think about it. Um, they tend to be a little larger because they have lots of stored fat in their abdomen and it has to last till next spring. Um, and these won't mate till the spring. So the other ones, as soon as, you know, we mentioned they, you know, once they go and they pupate and they emerge out as an adult, the first thing they're going to do is try to mate and lay more eggs. But these guys aren't. These guys are going to hatch out. They're going to come out of that chrysalis as an adult, and then they're going to start heading south. Uh, this is triggered by shorter days and cooler air. Um, as you notice right now, it's starting to get a little darker every night. Um, you know, at, at nighttime, it's starting to get a little darker, which is kind of sad that you can't stay out as late. And then we're starting to get these cooler nights. And that's what's uh, the trigger that sets them that, oh, it's time to go and head south. They actually gain weight as they fly, which is kind of crazy to think that they're going on this th up to a 3,000 mile journey, depending on where they start, like for some of the ones that start up near Michigan. Um, but they gain weight as they fly because they will often glide on air currents. So they're state conserving their energy by not flapping their little wings and just gliding along. And they're still trying to feed on as much as they can on their way down to Mexico. But the most amazing thing is it is still a mystery on how they know the way. We scientists still don't know how these little monarchs know how to get back to, um, to Mexico because they've never been there before. It was like their great, great grandmother that came back from Mexico from the winter before. So it's pretty amazing that they know how to get down there. So once they arrive into Mexico, they're trying to get to the transvolcanic mountains of, uh, in central Mexico. That's about 10,000 feet above sea level in a fir forest. It wasn't until 1975 that the scientists, scientists found their overwintering sites. Before then, it was just locals um, who had, had known about this phenomenon happening, like where they were all going. Um, as you can see this picture here to the right there, it looks like the leaves on this tree maybe be turning color because it's fall, um, but those are all monarchs hanging and clustering on those trees. So why this location works so well is it's a cool location, not, you know, it's cool because there's all those monarchs, but it's cool because temperature wise, um, it causes them to slow their metabolism down. So that conserves energy that can help them overwinter there. Um, it's how the mountains are around these trees. It's protection from a lot of wind and snow. There's lots of moisture there from the fog that often comes in so they can get their water sources and moisture, but they're not getting drenched with rain. So on cooler days, um, you know, most of the time they're going to stay clustered on the trees together to stay warm. On warmer days, you can see them up flying up in the sky. They might fall down onto the ground, but then often they will just crawl right back up, up on the tree to cluster together. And that's very important that they can go, and if they fall, if they happen to fall on the ground, it's very important that they get up there at night um, to stay warm together within the cluster. So I have a couple photos coming up that I wanna share with you. Um, I have not been there in person. My father-in-law has actually been there and has some really amazing photos of, of some of their uh, overwintering sites. So you can see here, again, it looks like these leaves are just all brown hanging on this tree um, or a, a dead branch maybe that is like leaning on, but these are all thousands of thousands of monarchs clustering together uh, in this fir forest. 
I think this is probably one of my favorite pictures to see. Again, they look like leaves kind of falling, but on a warmer day in the winter, you can see all of the butterflies flying, um, flying around during the day and gliding around, and then they go back to those trees at nighttime. Uh, this is the main location where they like to overwinter at, but there's some other preserves in the same area where a lot of these butterflies fly to. And just to look up and see thousands and thousands of butterflies flying over you. Pretty cool. It would be a neat experience to, to have you. Okay. So spring migration. Uh, they start, um, so once again, so we have, they know to move south in the, you know, for the winter based on, oh, the, you know, the light is changing, it's getting colder at night. I mean, not, it's not cold, but, you know, there's a temperature change. Uh, so in the spring, it's the same thing happening. They notice that, oh, okay, the sun is, you know, it's getting, staying lighter longer. Um, it's getting a little warmer. So that's when, so this whole time they haven't made it or anything, they will start to mate. Um, and then they will start to move down, down the mountain. Um, around the second week of March is when they start to fly. So that's when they can start tracking them again. And this is when the females will be on the search for milkweed to start laying their eggs, because as we know, they can only use milkweed or they cannot reproduce. And you can see that we have actually two, two, um, migrations that occur. We have the Eastern United States, and then we also have the Western United States uh, monarchs. So the Eastern one is the one that does the really big trek that we often think about. So to continue with the spring migration, the females start to lay their eggs on milkweed in the Southern states. The caterpillars hatch and start to recolonize the parent's home. And then those life cycles of those generations that I mentioned start to occur that three to five generations of summer. So they, you know, continue to lay eggs and hatch out and adults and then they continue to fly north. And so after predators, there's a cold, the flight, think about how far that is for a little, a little insect to travel. If there's no milkweed present, they will not, they will not survive. They will perish. And that's been one of the issues that we've had with the monarch is that they are not having a host plant to reproduce on. Um, again, it's amazing to think that that monarch, that it has, you know, it survived, its great, great grandmother was the one who left, left um, Mexico from the last migration. And then it's, it somehow knew the way to make it all the way back. Um, and then its offspring will know how to come back too. So it's pretty cool. So how can you help the monarch? Uh, we can do this by doing monarch way stations. And a lot of this information, almost most of this information comes from uh, monarchwatch.com, uh, which is really, uh, and I have some, a little information on it at the end of this, which is a great site. If you're really interested in the monarchs, finding out about how, how they, you know, more about their biology, about ways, other ways that you can help them, monarchwatch.com is a great uh, resource. So monarch way stations are very popular. I'm sure if you are on here, you've probably heard of them before or are hoping to learn more about them tonight. Uh, there are places that provide resources necessary for monarchs to produce successive generations and to, to sustain their migration, whether it be to get them started, um, be there for that food source when they come back in the spring, or just to be a pit stop on their way as they go back in the fall. So the decline of the monarch is from a couple of different reasons. Uh, development, and that is not only here in the United States where we're having, you know, farmland developed or uh, fields, prairie developed, things like that, but also where they overwinter at. There is a, a major issue with a lot of the overwintering sites being destroyed for lumber. Uh, so they're trying to make more preserves around those areas in Mexico, um, uh, make it where it, it cannot be developed and destroyed. But that is a major issue that is happening that, that the monarchs are getting there and then there's no um, place to overwinter. Another thing is genetically modified crops. Uh, when I say this, it's not necessarily the GMOs themselves, it's, it's the 
the chemicals we are using on the genetically modified crops. Um, so when we use Roundup to spray corn, soybeans, other crops where some of our traditional milkweeds tend to grow, we're killing those milkweeds off. So we're killing the host plants. Another thing is roadside management. Spraying, using those chemicals, um, using those herbicides to spray and kill down weeds along our roadside. We're also killing down uh, a lot of our milkweed that the host plant for the monarch. So contributing to monarch conservation, an effort that will help assure the preservation of the species and continuation of the spectacular migration phenomenon. So that's the goal of the monarch way stations, that we want to provide not only uh, those host plants for the monarchs to reproduce and lay their eggs on, but we also want to provide a good nectar source. And I will tell you that they don't only help the monarch, but they're going to also help a lot of our other pollinators that really need our help as well. So just some basic requirements about the Monarch Way Stations. They, if you want to have an official Monarch Way Station where you can get this lovely sign as well as pictured there at yours, uh, you need a minimum of 100 square feet. This can be split into multiple sites um, in an area, at least six hours of sunlight a day, and just general you know, plant requirements, a good drainage, because good drainage is going to help us avoid root rot. And it's going to give our plants a better, um, better start. Not all plants like wet feet. Uh, shelter. So plants should be relatively close, but we don't want to overcrowd because this can lead to some disease issues with our plants. Um, we want to make sure that they are spaced out. And I have some really cool information to share uh, about spacing of milkweed, especially um, from some research that UK did a couple of years ago. Uh, and management, uh, just like with your normal flower beds, you want to mulch, deadhead, water, weeding, make sure it's in an area. I always tell people with growing things that it's in an area that, you know, you're going to go out and visit it. You're, it's not going to be really far away from your house or a water source because nobody wants to water when it's really hot. Um, and, you know, someplace that you're actually going to be able to go out and enjoy it. Great school projects, great, you know, a different garden, community centers. So according to the Monarch, Monarch Watches site and to become an official Monarch Way station, you need at least to have at least 10 um, milkweed plants, preferably two different species that there, um, and lots of nectar plants, at least four annual, biannual, some perennial ones to provide nectar. And then you might want to add a puddling spot. A uh, puddling spot is just a, an area where the butterflies can get a source of, of water. So putting a shallow dish with a bunch of pebbles in it so they can land on the pebbles and drink the water. Um, sometimes you'll see butterflies puddling together, together um, getting uh, like near dirty water um, or, pud or puddles, because it's called puddling spot, um, puddles to get nutrients from the from the soil, so to pick up like salts and stuff, because that's going to help with their reproduction and with a lot of butterflies. Okay, lay, way station layout. So this is something um, new and something that uh, some of our uh, extension professors at UK and a, a fellow graduates um, classmate of mine in the entomology department had did his research on uh, monarchs and have some of these monarch way stations and how they worked in different layouts and about different milkweed. So I have reference to a couple of his papers and I have a slide at the end that has like where those papers are. So if you're really interested in finding about milkweed placement, about the types of milkweed that work really well, which ones don't, um, he has some really good and I promise easy to read uh, research papers. They're not overwhelming when you look at them. Um, with some good monarch and milkweed information. So from some of their studies that they found that they did uh, at the UK Arboretum and around uh, Central Kentucky, that open area versus like a courtyard, you're gonna have much better luck with having uh, monarchs come in if it's an open area versus in a courtyard or versus like if you have one in your backyard and you have really tall shrubbery put around it or trees blocking things, you're gonna see more uh, monarchs that way. Plus, you're probably going to see more other butterflies and, and pollinators as well um, if it's an easier path for them to get to. Milkweed placement is a big one. So this image is from one of their, their um, studies that they did. They found that milkweed uh, that is put around the outside of the planting ended up having more monarchs 
more monarch eggs and caterpillars on it than those that were placed within or sporadic through, throughout. The, it seems like the monarchs had a harder time finding the, um, the, uh, 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 the milkweed when they were spread sporadic and everything was on top of each other. The other thing is, and I'll mention this again at the end, we end up seeing a lot of predation of monarch caterpillars. So predation predators from uh, European hornets, some other um, larger um, of hornets and wasps will feed on their the caterpillars of the monarch. Um, and so when those, uh, mon those milkweed plants are really close to those nectar sources, those nectar sources um, bring in those wasps and predators. And so when they were closer together, they ended up seeing more predation of those monarch caterpillars. They also found that taller plants uh, had more, more eggs and more caterpillars on them, that the monarchs were, they tended to land on um, taller, isolated plants. So that first one that A, uh, that demonstrates there having the milkweed around the outside is spaced out. They tended to see way more um, eggs and caterpillars feeding on the milkweed. Uh, you want to make sure that you use nectar rich annuals as well. Something that's easy, you know, easy to put out there every year. So perennials are fantastic to use as well. Um, but if you just need to bump up your food source, uh, get some zinnias, marigolds, lantana. There's all sorts of other good nectar rich um, um, annuals you can stick out there in your way station. Think about the flower shape. And I say this because of like with all, with all butterflies, when you look, think about a zinnia or like if you look at like a daisy, a classic daisy, it has that radial shape of those petals. It's the perfect landing pad for a butterfly to land on and feed. So when you're thinking about some of those annuals or other um, plants for those nectar sources you want to put out there, you want to have it where they have a nice um, radial shape that it allows a perfect place for them to land on. Uh, don't use so many con contrasting colors. So Butterflies can, like I mentioned, they can see really good color, but we studies have shown, and this is just for butterflies in general as well. Um, if you use more of a solid color, you will have, you will most likely see more butterflies. They like large swaths of color versus like sporadic. So do a couple of plantings of one solid color and you're probably gonna see more butterflies coming to that area because they can just see it, that big chunk of it versus being sporadic around. So just some pictures of milkweed to start off so our milkweed um, discussion. Uh, so this is common milkweed. Uh, this is the one that I, these are all I have growing out in pastures on my farm. Um, you can see where you have those nice big blooms and the leaves that they like to land on to feed from. Um, and tons of tons of other insects use that. Then you get those spiky seed pods. And then when they're ready to, uh, the seed to be dispersed, uh, they will pop open. And that's what you wanna look for if you're trying to collect the seed. So we have five um, native species of milkweed in Kentucky. Uh, this one you can grow, you can try to grow, but a lot of times they will defoliate it completely. Um, and it, it's better use and it gets quite large. So it's better use out into pastures. Um, and just to go through them, and then I'll talk a little bit about more. So we have butterfly weed that is a good one to have on your yard. Swamp milkweed, that one, you don't need a swampy area for it to grow well. It will grow well in, in gardens. And both the butterfly weed and swamp milkweed, I feel, are readily available versus the common milkweed. You're probably going to have to go out if you want to try to grow that one or put that out in your fields um, and, you know, collect some seed yourself. We also have world milkweed and green milkweed as well. And those are the five native ones to Kentucky. Um, each one of them has, I think, their own challenges of starting them. If you want to add some to your, your garden, I would recommend uh, going and buying transplants. We have a couple of nurseries around the area, depending on where you live. Um, I know not everyone is from close here uh, near Mercer County, but or the Lexington area, but there are a couple of different nurseries that will have a native plant section and you can find butterfly weed and the swamp milkweed readily available uh, to plant. 
So if you collect seeds from any of these, a lot of these plants, they need to go through a stratification process. So that means that they're going to need a cold process in order for them to germinate. So if you're out there and you want to collect some of this like uh, common milkweed like here, if you see it in that where it's in that pod form, I would just go ahead and collect it and then plant it where you want to put it, put it at in your yard or fields. And, um, you know, you might not have a, a great germination rate, but just going ahead and planting it in the fall, where it's one of those natives will allow it to have that cold period and hopefully it will germinate for you. Again, with the monarchs, their preference is taller plants is what they tend to, what this studies that uh, um, Mr. I should have said his name, Adam Baker, um, found in his, his studies with him and Dan Potter. Um, and then there was, they've done another study as well, and I'll have the, um, the title of that paper if anyone is interested in looking at it too. Um, they're not biased when it comes to milkweed. So a lot of times you hear people are like, well, I want to go out and collect milkweed seed and try to grow my own because I want the wild type versus I don't want one that has been cultivated. They might be a native, but it's still cultivated. So they did studies with this as well at um, UK's Arboretum and a few other locations across the state and with um, different uh, citizen scientists, as we say, and they tried these different milkweeds. And in the end, they found that the monarch didn't care. It liked all of them. Um, they had good egg laying on all of them and good caterpillar growth on all of them. The main thing that they did find was, again, if it was a taller plant, they went to them first. And if it was isolated, they went to it first uh, versus anything being close together or the smaller ones. But they would go on the, the shorter ones as well. So when we think we need, we need nectar plants as well, um, as I said, they're not picky eaters, um, but they really like some nectar heavy plants. So there's a couple of things you can think about adding to flower beds around your yard or your, um, or your monarch waste station. So Joe pie weed is a great one that they really like, bee balm, and those, kind of, those both get kind of big, but there are some varieties of Joe pie weed that they have that are smaller now. Um, and then their native blazing star, not only will butterflies be all over this, you will have so many bees and different native bees and really cool insects on these guys as well. Um, some other things that can go into the fall and so that like things that are blooming right now that, um, that, that the monarchs are going to really love and all sorts of insects are going to love. So like New England asters are blooming right now. That is a great source of nectar for all butterflies and pollinators, goldenrod. Um, you know, I, I told it, I, I feel like everyone knows like now that goldenrod is not what's really making you sneeze. But I had, I told somebody else the other day that it's, it's the ragweed that's making them sneeze and not the goldenrod because goldenrod has such a very heavy pollen on it. Um, it doesn't really blow around a lot. Um, honeybees especially love that right, right now as well. Um, and then we have purple coneflower. So purple coneflower is a good one. It's a native. It goes good in the summer and we can have it going into the fall. Also, uh, rutabecchia, all sorts of different perennials that can be a good nectar source this time of year for those monarchs on their journey. More nectar plants, just some annuals, some Mexican sunflower, zinnias, lantana, even though that's not, you know, well, the, none of these are really native ones, but you know, you're just planting them as an annual, but you can see that on that zinnia and the Mexican sunflower, that radial shape on the, of that flower um, is a perfect for any type of butterfly and the monarchs to land and feed on. So a couple of different things for um, references with planting. So these two sources right here, Kentucky Pollinator Handbook um, from the Natural Resource and Conservation Service. And then I really like this one that's with the Pollinator Partnership, Selecting Plants for Pollinators, and they have different guides uh, based on where you live in the U United States. Um, so this one is really cool because sometimes I, I, I've looked in the past at like, you know, what are they recommending for out west? if you're planting for pollinators, but it will break down uh, for trees, shrubs, perennials, uh, some annuals, all things that are perfect, that grow well in our state for pollinators. Um, 
And so, and, and it even goes far down to break it down to be, these are better for honeybees or these are better for, for butterflies or for beetles or flies or whatever you're trying to attract. Um, and then information about the seeds or if they're better as a transplant, et cetera. So tagging monarchs, uh, this is a part of the Monarch Wash program as well. Um, this started in, in 1992 to help understand the dynamics of monarchs' spectacular fall migration and through marking them and uh, through mark and recapture. Um, so when it, this, this came about so we can determine where these monarchs are coming from, the timing and pace of the migration, the morality during migration, mortality, excuse me, uh, changes in the geographic distribution, and it shows the probability of reaching Mexico related to the location, the size of the butterfly, and the date. So if you go through this whole, you know, I'm going to do a monarch way station, and you want to take it a step further, uh, this is where you could, you can do it. You can help scientists uh, by tagging monarchs. Um, and I know a couple of people locally who've been doing that. They have monarch way stations, and then they they find the chrysalis that they see as before the monarch emerges and they bring them in in their little um, butterfly cages, they hatch out and then they, they tag them to release them on their journey. So there's a, sure, and maybe many of you, if you since you're on this talk tonight have seen where there is a, a monarch that was recently tagged uh, in Kentucky traveled 1600 miles to Mexico. So it's been on the news where this one was actually recovered and they said something about like, there had been like over 600 um, monarchs that they have tagged. And this is the first one that they, you know, actually confirmed uh, arrived. So that one happened last year. There's different tagging events around the state. This one was through Kentucky Wild. There's many other ones. I know the Perryville Battlefield uh, in Boyle County has um, a great pollinator uh, area. And that's where they did that Kentucky wild tagging of monarchs to, to release them. So, but you can tag your own. You can order tagging kits through the Monarch Watch um, and submit your tagging data. So it was really, which is really cool. So you can actually, you know, um, submit that when you released ones or if you find ones and you see that they've been tagged, you can put that information in there and that helps them let them know how the monarch population is doing. So I would encourage you if you really love monarchs to go to monarchwatch.org and find out more information about how to um, tag them to get your way station kit going. They used to sell seed because at one point I did order a bunch of seed from them, uh, but I don't think they're doing that anymore, but they have great resources of uh, the different types of milkweed that you know are the best milkweed for your area. So a couple of things to consider as I kind of wrap up, I know this wasn't too long of a talk, but hopefully I didn't talk too fast, but things to consider uh, with watering uh, to avoid some overhead sprinklers. If you can water at the base of plants, that's gonna help, especially what comes to mind instantly is like, I always grow a lot of zinnias and they tend to get powdery mildew really easily. So try to water at the base to try to um, suppress that disease pressure on those plants. The other reason why if you're watering, you don't wanna splash all your butterflies or your monarchs that land on your plants because then they'll have to take a break for a little while before they can start flying again. And that can also, um, you know, predators can come after them at that vulnerable state. Uh, expect other pollinators, expect that there be lots of bees whether they be bumblebees, honeybees, um, all sorts of different native bees that we have. Lot, you will see wasp. Um, wasp are attracted to uh, the nectar sources. They need those carbohydrates to get them uh, the energy they need to fly. So again, that's why I mentioned that they have found in studies where if you plant your um, milkweed too close to um, a lot of your nectar sources, a lot of your caterpillars will get eaten. I can attest to that. That happened to me. Um, I had a couple of monarch caterpillars. I'm super excited about them. I went and checked on them every day after work and slowly each day they kept disappearing and it was not because they were going in their little chrysalis, um, but because I had all my nectar sources nearby and I also would see a ton of, of wasp. Um, you'll also see flies as well. Um, expect some pests. 
So there will be the milkweed aphids that you can see on them, um, milkweed bugs that is pictured here on that seed pod, um, and milkweed beetles. Uh, you know, and just you know, they might if you're trying to get seed, that can be an issue from some for for some of them. But most of the time, they're all going to just coexist together. Um, and so you want to be, you know, think about that. You're just going to let them coexist together and not think about using insecticides to try to control one or the other. Because most likely, if you try to use an insecticide to control these guys, you're going to end up hurting your caterpillars. As I mentioned, there's predators out there. Um, the wasp are going to be the biggest thing, and they're mostly going to go after your caterpillars. Uh, you'll see adult monarchs with a little bit of wing damage to them sometimes, and that could be from a variety of things, but a lot of times um, it can, it's birds, birds that, uh, you know, try, try them one time and they manage to get away. Um, but your caterpillars are going to be what is the most threat from a different wasp, European hornets, especially this time of year coming out and, and getting them and feeding on them. And then you want to avoid insecticides. If you're, you know, if you, like I said, just let the pests coexist with them. Uh, if you're really worried about a pest, get a bucket of soapy water and knock like knock these um, milkweed bugs in a bucket of soapy water versus um, risking using one of those chemicals on there and possibly harming your caterpillars. So with that, these are those papers that I mentioned. Uh, the colonization and usage of eight milkweed species by monarchs and bees in the urban garden settings. The configuration and location of small urban gardens affect colonization of monarch butterflies and suitability of native milkweed species versus cultivars supporting monarch butterflies. And like I said, what we learned from all of these papers was that monarchs just really like milkweed. <laughs> so they'll go to multiple different kinds. Um, they also are going to look for the tall, tall plants that are um, are isolated. And uh, there was something else I was going to mention about them. So they're going to, you know, they're just going to want that that milkweed. And uh, and that's I think that's about all I have. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was great information, and you may have already answered. I see that. Uh, we do have one question in the chat from Marilyn, and it's concerning uh, some failures. It looks like uh, she has tried to seed some milkweed and transplant some milkweed. I guess, is there any other comments that you would have besides the ones you've already made in your presentation on common failure points with milkweed? I know weather plays a big role, but what else, Jessica, that may help Marilyn address her issues she's uh, yeah. put in the chat? Yeah, it, it depends on which one you're you're trying to to do with I, I would really recommend ordering transplants if to try to get it started um order transplants or go to the local nursery that has them I know and, and like some of the local nurseries are very specific about like they do not treat those plants as like a lot of plants get treated at nurseries to keep pest numbers down but those native ones for pollinators usually don't um at certain nurseries I should say but I would if you have seen now, I would go ahead and plant it out outside. Some of these are hard to transplant. If you're going to transplant a milkweed plant, you want to try to find the smallest one that you possibly can, uh, not to disturb the roots so much. Um, but I would transplant something that's very tiny versus a larger plant. And I would definitely, if you could seed them, but they still need to have that cold period. That's very important for all of these native milkweeds. They need to go through that cold period. And I believe you could put them in your, I know I read somewhere you could put them in your refrigerator, I think for a short period of time, but I would have to double check with how long that you would do that. But I think the easiest thing for me would be to seed them. Um, you can also seed like in milk jugs. We've done that before where you can like fill a milk jug with soil put your seed in there and then set that milk jug outside in the winter time or like in a garage area where it's kind of protected and, and get some germination to occur with some of those native plants that need um, a cold period. Tom also had a related question as you're talking about this, Jessica, is the best time to set those transplants out? Set the, when you have a transplant, I would do um, once mm -hmm. they're transplants like in the spring. Yes. Yeah. 
in the springtime, just yeah. Yeah, once we're probably once the risk of frost is passed. Okay. And looks like Marsha just had another question. You, if you look at the very end of the chat there, how often have you seen viceroy butterflies in your garden? Uh, I have. I haven't seen as many as I would think that I would see since it's our state insect, right? I have seen more monarchs than I have seen than vices, which is a good thing that I'm seeing so many monarchs, right? That means people are out there doing stuff to, to encourage them to go on their migration. 